We just saw Mill argue for freedom of action and speech on utilitarian grounds, but also saw that he was less confident in the free market's ability to guarantee the greatest good for the greatest number. He was particularly concerned with the unequal distribution of wealth that it produced. This problem is still around today, and it seems that government intervention would be necessary to accomplish such a goal. But is that goal worthwhile? Is it just? To answer this question, we must examine the arguments of perhaps the most influential and important political philosopher of the 20th century, John Rawls, and his most famous critic, Robert Nozick. Like Plato, both are trying to articulate what they think would constitute a just society. And, like Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau, they are doing so by envisioning what people would agree to in a state of nature. But Rawls and Nozick come to very different conclusions. Rawls gives a full defense of his theory in his 624-page masterpiece, A Theory of Justice. But the essence of his argument can be found in his later 1985 essay called Justice is Fairness. In short, Rawls suggests a just society is a fair society, and we should aim to make society as fair as possible. But what does it mean for a society to be fair? We can capture Rawls' basic idea with a thought experiment. Suppose you have six people and only one pie. Let's make it my late grandmother's rhubarb pie. She was a master chef. And we'll make the six people my dad and five of his brothers at Thanksgiving. Now, in reality, one of them would usually arrive early and just hide the pie from the others. That way, he had it to himself. Clearly, that is not a fair distribution. But what would be? And how could we ensure that it is distributed fairly? Well, it's quite simple. Put my dad in charge of cutting the pie, but make sure that he gets the last piece. Because he wants to ensure that he gets the biggest piece possible, he'll make a special effort to ensure the pie is cut as equally as possible. He might even get out a measuring tape. If he cuts it unequally, making some pieces bigger or smaller, his brothers will take the bigger pieces and leave him with the smallest, right? He gets the last piece. Now, of course, we already knew this. Dividing and distributing the pie equally is fairest. What's novel here is the method by which we derive this conclusion. We asked, how would someone divide up the pie if he didn't know which piece he was going to get? Rawls suggests that we can perform a similar thought experiment to discover what a just society looks like. If we imagine a group of people about to be placed into a society without knowledge of what place they will have in that society, and then assign them the task of agreeing to principles that will govern that society, we can discover what a just society looks like. We can discover the rules, even, that would govern it. But how might we imagine such a situation, and what principles would they agree to? I like to imagine a situation similar to the one in Christopher Nolan's movie, Interstellar. So suppose we one day make Earth inhospitable to human life, and there's no way to get the remaining humans physically off the planet. So, to save the human race, we send billions of frozen, fertilized embryos to populate a new planet. And so that we survive, each of us records our DNA and neural configuration onto a hard drive, and we arrange things so that each of the embryos will have one of our DNA neural configurations imprinted onto it. Like whatever DNA the embryo originally has, it'll have our DNA after the imprint and it'll have our neural structure. Machines will build the infrastructure of a functioning society, and the newly imprinted embryos will then populate that society. Okay, that's the initial situation here. But let's also suppose that we recognize that it was abuses of power made possible by social injustices that rendered the Earth inhospitable. 
people in positions of power refuse to admit that their greed was destroying the planet until it was too late. We don't want to condemn the new society in this, to the same fate, so we want to give them an opportunity to design their society to be just. To accomplish this, Rawls would suggest that we let the embryos develop to adulthood, but wait to imprint them, letting them remain what we might call blank prototypes for a while. Instead, we would first give them a basic education about the world and how society works. They'll learn about government, laws, and jails, and fines, and about how people have different life plans based on their talents and abilities and values. Through a study of Earth history, they'll even learn that Unlike the Pi scenario, equality is practically impossible, that things like communism just end up making things worse for everyone. So they'll learn that their society will have a social ladder. They'll be rich and poor and easy jobs and hard jobs and good pay and lousy pay, and likely not enough jobs for everyone. This will put them in what Rawls calls the original position. They're, going to, they're about to be placed into a society with a general knowledge of how that society will work. We would then give them the task of agreeing upon rules that would serve as that society's organizing principles. But to make sure those principles are just or fair, Rawls would suggest, we should keep them ignorant about which pattern will be imprinted on them. We'd give them access to the hard drive so they could see what person they could be, all right? Looking at the list, well, this is Bob Bucket. He's a famous movie star with millions of dollars. Uh, here's Jane Doe. She's a working mother of three who goes to church and always wanted to be a singer. Uh, this is John Smith. He's been left unable to work by a series of health problems and accidents. Uh, this is Joe Blow. He has a mental illness and likes to murder people. They could be any one of these people, but they'll have no idea who they will B. This will place them under what Rawls called a veil of ignorance. Consequently, they'll have no idea what rung on the social ladder they'll be on, whether they'll be rich or poor or famous or unknown. They won't know what job they'll have or will even want to have. They will have no idea what their talents or abilities will be, what kind of life they'll want, what they'll value, whether they'll be secular or religious or into sports or books and philosophy. Even their gender will be unknown to them. If this is true, just like my dad and uncles with the rhubarb pie, the principles and laws they agree to will be, Rawls argues, as fair as possible. So, what principles of justice would the blank prototypes in the original position under a veil of ignorance agree to? Well, pretend you're one of the prototypes. First of all, since you could literally end up being anyone in society, you'd want to protect all people's liberty equally. Even though you don't know what values or life plans you'll end up having, you do know you'll want the liberty to pursue those plans. Now, you wouldn't want to protect Joe Blow, the murderer's liberty, to murder others. After all, it's much more likely that you'd be one of Joe's victims than end up being Joe himself. Of course, it's still possible that you, you could be Joe, right? You might end up being Joe. And so you don't want to just kill him or toss him aside. Joe should get the kind of medical help he obviously needs. Or if he has to be locked away, he should at least have access to basic necessities because you might end up being Joe. For such reasons, Rawls argues, the prototypes would agree on principle of justice number one. Quote, each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive scheme of equal basic liberties compatible with a similar scheme of liberties for others. End quote. As you might notice, this is somewhat like Mill's harm principle, but instead of being restricted from nothing besides that which harms others, you're restricted from nothing other than interfering with other people's liberty. But what about economic resources? How should they be divided? Well, the prototypes have been educated about how societies work, so they know that complete equality is a pipe dream. There, there will be a social ladder. 
but they also know they could end up occupying any rung on that social ladder. Correspondingly, they will want two things to be true of this social ladder. First, they'll want it to be traversable. Movement up and down the social ladder should be possible for anyone. We don't want people working jobs they're unqualified for, but we wouldn't want tradition or a caste system or economic status or unequal access to education to lock people in their socioeconomic place. Mill would like this. It would also involve taxes and laws regarding inheritance that prevent specific families from amassing all the wealth and power and passing it down over the generations, basically locking off people from attaining that higher rung on the social ladder. Second, Rawls argues, while they would realize that socioeconomic inequalities are inevitable, they would want those that do exist to work to everyone's advantage especially the least fortunate. Now, what does this mean? It doesn't mean that they simply want to redistribute wealth to make the difference between the rich and poor as small as possible, right? Suppose, for example, that we have an economic system where the incomes range from 50,000 uh, 50, to 10 million. To reduce income inequality, let's say we impose a salary cap so that any income over 100,000 will, will be redistributed by those who, to those who make the least. But by doing so, the rich no longer have extra money to invest and start a business. And no one wants to do the previously high paying jobs that were difficult but highly valuable. Like no one wants to be a doctor or an engineer because it's just not worth the work. You don't make enough money by doing so. It's too much schooling and that kind of stuff. Consequently, the economy stagnates. And the stagnation is so bad that even with redistribution from the rich, the lowest income drops all the way down to 5,000, and now there are no more hospitals or roads and bridges. Even though this would greatly reduce income disparity from millions down to like 95,000, this would not be preferable. Not only did the poorest benefit from hospitals and rows that existed in the previous arrangement that were made possible by those higher salaries, but this change actually made them financially worse off. Before they were making 50,000, now they're only making five. The first system was better. Now, we wouldn't want the millionaires in the first system to use, to be able to use their wealth to keep others from attaining it. That would violate the previously mentioned social mobility proviso. My point is simply that for Rawls, income inequality itself is not necessarily a bad thing, as long as the fact that that fact that there is an inc income inequality makes everyone better off. And so, Rawls argues, people in the original position under the veil of ignorance would also agree to principle of justice number two. Quote, social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they are both A, reasonably expected to be to everyone's advantage, and B, attached to positions and offices open to all, end quote. Now, given my example and the fact that Rawls is okay with income inequality that benefits everyone, you might think that Rawls' argument could be used to defend supply-side economics, where it's thought that giving more money to the rich allows them to expand their businesses, create more jobs, stimulate the economy, and thus give the poor more money than they otherwise would have. And Rawls' theory would favor supply-side economics if it worked. Unfortunately, it does not. The failure of supply-side economics, also known as trickle-down economics, is one of the most well-established facts in all of economics. In the United States, the tax rate on the richest went from over 90% to approximately 35% from the 50s to 2000, and yet reduction in top tax rates never correlated with income growth, income, uh, economic growth, wage growth, or job creation. As the International Monetary Fund put it in June 2015, increasing the income share of the poor and the middle class actually increases growth, while a rising income share of the top 20% results in lower growth. That is, when the rich get richer, benefits do not trickle down. Truth be told, and I think Rawls would agree, it seems that no economic system just naturally generates 
inequality that works to everyone's advantage. The only way to make sure that inequality works to everyone's advantage is with government intervention. Rawls is not a communist. He realizes that forcing total equality would just make everyone poor. A free market is needed for economic growth and to generate income. But once the highest incomes are high enough to generate incentive for the highly valuable and difficult jobs and to keep the economy functioning and healthy, all extra monies should be taxed and redistributed to the poor, either directly through some kind of welfare program, such as pensions for the elderly, or by using that money on programs to give equal opportunities to the poor, subsidize housing, soup kitchens, education, and the like. It will take some work and try, trial and error to find just the right balance, but it's a balance worth finding, Rawls would say. And people in the original position under a veil of ignorance would agree, although if you're rich, it would be frustrating to have a large portion of your money taken in taxes, that's nothing compared to the frustration of someone who's homeless because they can't find a job or who works two jobs and still can't afford to feed their family. Someone in the original position would much rather avoid being the second person. They realize they could be either, but they want to avoid being the second person more, even if this meant they could end up being a rich person whose salary is capped. After all, how much pain can someone suffer by being forced to live on what, in reality, is far more than most people need to live comfortably. Now, given that the U.S. has many such programs for the poor, you might think that the U.S. is a fair and just Rawlsian state, but it decidedly is not. People in the original position would not agree with a minimum wage not being a living wage, as it is in many states. And they would also object to the wealthiest paying a lower percentage of, of their wealth in taxes than middle-class earners. But our economic situation is not the only thing that makes the U.S. fall short of the Rawlsian ideal. Although political offices are legally open to everyone, in practice they're not open to all. Only those who are independently wealthy can actually be successfully elected to important offices. In fact, a 2014 study by Martin Gillians of Princeton and Benjamin I. Page of Northwestern showed that only the rich have real political influence in the U.S. This includes lobbyists and corporations. Although we're a representative democracy in name, in practice, we're really an oligarchy, a society where the rich few have all the political power. Similar inequalities regarding education and opportunity make the social ladder untraversable. Many jobs are off limits to Sun simply because of their social status. We don't have a caste system per se, but your birth largely determines your place on the social ladder. Also, the things we make illegal on the grounds of morality, religion, offense, or self-harm would not square with Rawls' first principle. Take, for example, U.S. laws prohibiting polygamy, new dancing, selling and smoking of marijuana, indecent speech, and assisted suicide. And then there are laws that restrict religious equality. No one in the original position would agree to have a single religion's tenets be the basis for law or to have a single religion's symbols displayed at the courthouse, or keep any religion from erecting places of worship. Nevertheless, such practices are more than common throughout the United States. But, of course, Rawls is not without detractors. Some suggest that people in the original position under a veil of ignorance would be unable to come to any kind of decision about which principles of justice to adopt, because without knowing who they are, such persons would actually have no values at all. They wouldn't even value their own liberty. Now, this may seem strange, right? Doesn't everyone value their liberty? But take, for example, the Sunni Boras, a particularly conservative sect of Sunni Islam in which the distinction between religion and law is blurred. Even when they live in a land that is not controlled by Sharia law, they defer to it even when doing so does not favor their interests and restricts their liberty. Submission to authority is more important to them. Personal liberty actually stands in the way of their life goal of true religious devotion. Others, however, object that Rawls has it all wrong. 
that we should not even be concerned with fairness and justice as Rawls defines them. And this brings us to the most famous objection to Rawls made by his Harvard colleague, Robert Nozick, in his book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia. In a nutshell, Nozick concludes that Rawls fails to consider how the wealth of those in society is acquired and thus fails to appreciate the unfairness or injustice of taking what someone earned and giving it to those who did not. And the basis of his claim is familiar, natural rights, specifically the, the right to life, liberty, and property, and to have one's contracts honored. To take from the rich and give to the poor, Nozick argues, violates these rights. Nozick defends his view by reimagining how we emerge from the state of nature. Basically, to protect their natural rights, Nozick says, people would voluntarily band together and hire protectors, what Plato might have called guardians. Now, as these associations competed, they and their guardian forces would combine and grow larger. Eventually, they would become large enough to be considered a nation, and their guardian force would be a government. But it would be a government supported only by the voluntary contributions of those it protects and whose only role is the protection of natural rights. It would enforce contracts and protect its citizens from theft and foreign invasion and from getting beaten up and killed or enslaved by their neighbors, but that is all it would do. Now, you might wonder, if the government is supported only by voluntary contributions, what about freeloaders? who live in an area guarded by the guardians, but who refuse to pay for their services. Should the guardians, guardians force, uh, should the guardians force them to pay? No, says Nozick. They should not force the freeloaders to pay. That would be immoral. It's wrong to harm anyone without their consent. Since forcing protection money out of the freeloaders would be harming them without their consent, violating their right to property, it should not be done, Nozick says. Yet, the freeloaders, Nozick says, should still enjoy the protections the government provides. Why? Well, their protection from invasion is just going to be automatic since they live in the protected area, right? But they should also be protected from theft, violence, enslavement, and contract violations because, Nozick says, it's just wrong to just stand by and let someone's rights be violated or be harmed if you can prevent it. A guardian can't just stand by and let someone be enslaved because they haven't paid their dues. Besides, in order to fulfill their contract with paying members, the guardians are going to have to restrict the liberty of the freeloaders anyway. They can't just let a thieving freeloader steal from paying members. He'd have to be locked up. But, Nozick says, it's never right to restrict someone's liberty without giving them something in return. That, too, would be immoral. So, the guardians must essentially treat freeloaders as de facto paying members. Now, given this, you might wonder, what's to stop everyone from just refusing to pay and thus becoming a non-paying de facto member? It's the threat, says Nozick, of returning to the state of nature. Some people might become freeloaders, yes. But as soon as things start reverting to the state of nature, most people will be glad to pony up the dough to keep the government going. But again, it will be a government that provides protection only. Anything else would either be harming someone without their consent or violating their liberty without giving them something in return. No roads, no education, no health care, all that would have to be done by private enterprise so that the necessary funds would be acquired voluntarily. No minimum wage, no labor laws, and certainly no redistribution of wealth. Each requires unjust coercion. Now, as it admits, the system isn't going to be perfect. It certainly isn't going to generate the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Some people, for example, will starve, while others will have more food than they need. And that is, Nozick says, an unfortunate evil. But he says, you shouldn't rectify one evil, starvation, with another one, theft. Two wrongs don't make a right, and it's still wrong to harm others by taking from them what they have earned without their consent. 
And this, Nozick argues, is what Rawls failed to recognize. Rawls defined justice using a situation where no one had earned anything. And so everyone had an equal claim to the available resources, right? They hadn't earned anything. They were about to be placed into a society. But in the real world, people earn things. And when they do, it's wrong to take what they earn without their consent, regardless of what you do with it afterwards. Now, Nozick admits that not everyone actually deserves everything they earn. Often, what people are able to earn is simply due to their talents and their social status, which is just an accident of birth, a, a matter of luck. They didn't earn those talents or status, and so they are not deserved. And thus, what they earn, Nozick admits, with their talents and status is not deserved either. But, Nozick says, it would still be wrong to take what they have earned away from them anyway. Why? Because even if they don't deserve it, they are still entitled to it. In the same way that people own their bodies, they also own their talents and labor and are thus entitled to whatever they produce with it, regardless of whether they are morally deserving of it or not. If I star in a movie and sign a contract that gives me 10% of all sales, then I am entitled to 10% of all sales, regardless of whether I got the part because of my acting skills my natural good looks, or because my uncle is Francis Ford Coppola. And since I'm entitled to it, it would be wrong to take it from me, plain and simple. But I have to admit, as a reason to prefer Nozick's system to Rawls, I've always found this response inadequate. Sure, it's wrong to take what someone has earned or even is entitled to from them, but why does that kind of evil trump all others? Why is one person's right to property more important than, say, another person's right to life? Why isn't the prevention of suffering or ensuring that people get what they morally deserve even more important? Nozick says that two wrongs don't make a right, but that cuts both ways. Yes, the fact that we shouldn't say, let someone starve, doesn't make stealing from the rich morally acceptable. But the fact that we shouldn't steal from the rich doesn't make letting someone starve morally acceptable. In reality, it's just a choice between two evils, the evil of stealing from the rich and the evil of letting the poor suffer. And it's far from clear to me why the latter should trump the former, especially when Nozick admits that the rich in a are in a position to earn what they have only by a stroke of good luck, and the poor are poor only by a stroke of bad luck. Why is involuntary charity worse than involuntary poverty? Besides, Rawls is not talking about income equality. He's talking about taking money that, he, that the wealthy don't need, that many of them likely wouldn't even miss, and using it to simply provide basic necessities and equal opportunity to those in need. Consider two farmers. One is born with a natural talent for farming, a thousand acres of fertile land, and a brigade of brand new farming equipment and millions of dollars to keep it all running and to hire workers. Let's call him Fred. The other, let's call him Jim, is born with no talent, 100 acres of barren land and a few broken down pieces of equipment with no money to repair them. Fred produces five times more food than he could ever eat, while Jim barely produces any. After 10 years of hard work from both, Jim and his family are literally starving, while Fred and his family have so much they eat lavishly at every meal. Now, suppose Jim has asked Fred for help, but he refused to give it. But suppose I have an opportunity to steal some food from Fred and give it to Jim. Would that be wrong? Sure. But would it be as wrong as passing up the opportunity and just letting Jim starve? It seems not. At most, Fred will simply be eating slightly less luxurious meals. And if that's the right thing for me to do regarding Fred and Jim, why wouldn't it be the right thing for the government to do regarding the rich and poor? After all, Nozick's theory itself entails the evil of involuntary charity can be outweighed. Recall that Nozick held it would be morally acceptable for a guardian to rescue a freeloader from slavery 
even though doing so would have to be done on the paying citizen's dime without consent. But if it's acceptable to use their money to protect others from the horrors of slavery, why wouldn't it be acceptable to use their money to protect others from the horrors of poverty? That's not to say that the government couldn't still go overboard, taking too much in a seemingly futile attempt to make the world a perfectly fair place. Nozick himself makes a very good point that a perfectly just distribution of wealth would be impossible to maintain because any and every transaction would just undo it. So perhaps, just as we did with Smith and Marx, we might agree that the answer to our question, what makes society just or fair, lies somewhere in between Rawls and Nozick. After all, as Cahoon points out at the end of his lecture on libertarianism, before his death, even Nozick himself came to realize that the view he articulated in Anarchy, State, and Utopia was too hardcore. That brings us to the end of our discussion of political philosophy and leaves us with just one more big question to consider. It's probably the first question you thought of when you heard the title, The Big Questions of Philosophy. But it's a question that until now we have not been prepared to tackle. Everything we've considered so far will inform our answer to perhaps the biggest question of all, what is the meaning of life? Arthur Dent, the protagonist of one of my favorite novels, Douglas Adams' The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, never expected his home planet of Earth to be destroyed by an alien race of bureaucrats called the Vogons. He never expected to be hitchhiking across the galaxy in his bathrobe with his towel as his most useful tool, and he certainly never expected to be on a spaceship with the self-kidnapping president of the galaxy, Zaphod Beeblebrox, about to be destroyed by two nuclear missiles. But here he is. Fortunately for Arthur, their spaceship, the Heart of Gold, is equipped with an improbability drive designed to make the most improbable things happen. Unfortunately for Arthur, there's no way to tell what will happen. But since the alternative is certain annihilation, Arthur presses the button. And this is how, against all odds, a very surprised-looking whale was called into existence in the upper atmosphere of a planet called Magrathea. It immediately begins to plummet towards the planet's surface. And, since it's no longer a nuclear missile, as it does, the whale begins to ponder its existence. Ah! Oh, what's happening? Er, uh, excuse me, uh, who am I? Hello? Why am I here? What's my purpose in life? What do I mean by who am I? Notice how quickly the whale begins to dive into the big questions of philosophy. That last question is essentially the question of personal identity. And if he had time to ponder it further, like us, he might have been tempted by the conclusion that personhood is a fiction, that the question that he asked, who am I, is actually an empty question. In fact, had the whale's fall been long enough, he might have gone on to ask many of the questions we've considered in this course. Is there a God? Do I have a soul? Is there an afterlife? What is the mind? Am I free? What is right and wrong? If he'd been a great course's customer, I imagine the whale listening to this course with tiny earbuds in his ears as he falls, he might have been tempted by many of the same troubling conclusions we've considered. There is no God, soul, or afterlife. And even if minds do exist, they probably don't do anything. It's difficult to deny that free will is an illusion and equally difficult to find truth makers for moral statements. Unfortunately, the whale's allotted time is very brief and his philosophical ponderings are derailed by a much more immediate concern. 
And wow, hey, what's this thing suddenly coming towards me very fast? Very, very fast. So big and flat and round, it needs a big, wide sounding name like ow, ound, ground. That's it. That's a good name. Ground. I wonder if it'll be friends with me. And so ends the seeming meaningless existence of Douglas Adams' very surprised looking whale. But notice that the whale's existence is not unlike our own. Just like Adam's whale, we are called into existence randomly. Even though the existence of life somewhere in the universe is inevitable, your specific existence on this particular planet at this time is monumentally improbable. And just like the whale, we're simply moving toward our inevitable demise. We may live a little bit longer to ponder the big questions than the whale did, although in the grand scheme of things, not that much longer, but our ultimate death is unavoidable. We shall inevitably be splat upon the ground of the universe. And if the troubling answers I mentioned before are true, and there is no God, soul, or afterlife, just like the whale, we shall never be heard from again. In fact, if there is no free will, just like the whale, even the path we take to the ground is completely outside of our control. And if there are no truth makers for moral statements, then just like with the whale, it's difficult to see how any of our actions are right or wrong. And if they can't be right or wrong, it's difficult to see how they could possibly matter. Now, I'm not saying our philosophical ponderings have forced such conclusions on us, but they may have left us with the impression that our life is meaningless, just like the whales, which leads us to the question of this lecture, our final question, one raised most notably by perhaps the greatest group of philosophers ever to exist, Monty Python. What is the meaning of life? If in fact, it has any meaning at all. Now, it's important to note that even if those troubling answers do entail that life is meaningless, that's no reason to think those answers are false. You may want life to be meaningful, but remember, the fact that you want something to be true, not a good reason to think that it's true. And since whether life is meaningful is part of the question at hand, we can't merely assume that it is. If the troubling answers are the best answers we have, and they really do entail that life is meaningless, that life is meaningless. We can't abandon basic logic simply because it doesn't tell us what we want to hear. Fortunately, however, I don't think we're forced to such a conclusion. Simply put, even if those troubling answers are true, that doesn't mean that life is meaningless. To begin to see why, let's return again to Douglas Adams. Questions about the meaning of life and meaning itself are a theme in The Hitchhiker's Guide. In addition to the whale's ponderings, tiny aliens build a computer called Deep Thought to answer the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. Now, Deep Thought does find the answer. It's 42. But the aliens don't know what this means. And they realize that they don't know because they have no idea what the ultimate question is. Notice that of life, the universe, and everything isn't a question. So they build a bigger computer called Earth to find the question. But just as someone on the Earth is about to get to the answer, they're about to ask that question, well, that's when the Vogons came along and destroyed it, sending Arthur along on his adventure. Now clearly, what is the meaning of life is at least part of the ultimate question. But it turns out, by asking such a question, we may not be making any more sense than the tiny aliens were. First of all, what are we even asking about? Are we asking about the existence of the entire human race, about whether it's meaningful? Or are we inquiring about what it takes for an individual life to be meaningful? And if it's the latter, are entire lives meaningful from birth to death or just particular parts of an individual life? Regardless, 
What does the phrase life is meaningful even mean? Life doesn't have meaning like words have meaning. So what would it take for that statement to be true, that life is meaningful? It's not the same thing as being happy. After all, we could be very happy living in one of Nozick's experience machines. But most of us would agree that such a life is meaningless. And meaning isn't the same thing as being morally upstanding. A life dedicated to scientific discovery might seem meaningful, but would also be morally neutral. As you can see, we could spend an entire lecture, indeed a whole other course, like Jay Garfield's The Meaning of Life course, exploring what the question is even asking. So we're going to have to settle here for a quick overview. A common suggestion is that life is meaningful when it has a purpose. This is why some think that God's existence is necessary for life to be meaningful. Our life can be meaningful only if God causes to exist for a particular purpose or reason, because he had a specific plan, and then we play the role that God intends us to play in that plan. This is why some think that embracing atheism entails that life is meaningless. The problem, however, is that having a purpose isn't the same thing as having meaning. To reiterate a classic example, if God's plan were simply to let an alien race like the Vogons conquer the universe, and God merely put us on this planet for the purpose of being their food source as they happen by, as they're conquering the universe? Well, clearly, that's a God-given purpose, but most would not consider that to be a meaningful existence. Or, Suppose God placed a whale in the sky so that he could watch it plummet to the ground for his own amusement. It would clearly exist for a purpose, but that still wouldn't entail that the whale's existence had meaning. As Monty Python would put it, perhaps we're just one of God's little jokes. So a purpose is not enough for meaning. The goal the purpose is supposed to serve must itself be, well, a good or worthwhile goal, whatever that amounts to, if that purpose is going to instill meaning. Now, that's not to say that God having a worthwhile purpose for our lives wouldn't make it meaningful. But without knowledge of what that purpose is and that it's worthwhile, we can't even know that life is meaningful, much less know what the meaning is. And we've already seen how difficult knowledge regarding religious matters is to establish. We would simply have to take it on faith that God has a meaningful purpose for us. So the theist is in no better position than the atheist to say that life is meaningful or to know what that meaning is. Of course, we might be tempted to say that whatever purpose God has for us is just by definition worthwhile. But then we're right back to the Euthyphro problem again. God would choose such a goal because he recognizes it as worthwhile by some outside standard. And if there is a goal that is worthwhile by an outside standard, then our life could be meaningful regardless of whether God exists by simply contributing to that objectively worthwhile goal. So the troubling notion that God does not exist and thus can't instill a purpose on our life doesn't make answering the ultimate question any more difficult than it was to begin with. So what else might help make life meaningful? Well, many suggest its significance. This is what those who worry about the existence of the soul or the afterlife tend to think. Only if one existence stretches on into the afterlife can one's existence be significant. If you just cease to exist when you die, then it can't be. Otherwise, we are just insignificant lumps of matter on a speck of dust that will be obliterated by the sun in short order if we don't just obliterate ourselves first. This, it seems, was Thomas Nagel's suggestion. From the most external possible perspective, that, that of the universe itself, our lives cannot possibly matter. Even the most influential world leaders and influential scientists have affected only a very small portion of the universe. There are a few things to say in response to this. First of all, 
it doesn't seem that the soul is necessary for this kind of significance. As we've already seen, it's certainly not necessary for an afterlife. Resurrection might still be possible. And through technology, we one day may live way longer than past our biological death. And an afterlife might not even be necessary for one's life to be significant. For example, if you were to save the entire human race by making possible its colonization of another planet, well, that would seem pretty significant. Of course, maybe none of those things are likely to happen to you, right? So even though neither the soul nor the spiritual afterlife is necessary for a life of significance, maybe the existence of the soul and such an afterlife would make significant lives more common. After all, if you live forever, wouldn't you have a much better chance at leading a life that is significant? Well, actually, that's not clearly the case. Even an eternal existence would likely not be significant. After all, if you're just one of a gazillion immortal beings, what do you matter? How are you significant? And if you just wasted away seeking meaningless pleasures, well, how is that meaningful? To make matters worse, it's not even clear that such significance is what we should be concerned about. That's not to say that significance itself is a bad thing or that significance can enhance something's meaning. For example, Nobel Peace Prize winner Norman Borlaug is often credited with saving the lives of literally a billion people in India through the development of genetically modified wheat. In the 1960s, India's, po India's population was set to outstrip its ability to feed itself until Borlaug introduced a strain of GMO wheat that was resistant to most pests and produced three times a typical yield. Now, if that strain had been only slightly better than non-GMO wheat, and so we only saved, say, 100,000 lives instead of a billion, well, we would consider his accomplishment less significant and likely less meaningful. But still, even if that can contribute to meaning, it's not clear that a life that is more significant because it is eternal actually is more meaningful. As Julian Baghini points out, an infinitely long basketball game or a never-ending movie would clearly be more significant. But aren't games and movies that end more meaningful? In the same way, even though an eternal life would be more significant, wouldn't a life that has a conclusion be more meaningful? Some have even argued that an infinite existence would be the most meaningless existence of all. How can our actions have any urgency unless we only have a limited time to do them? What would be the point of doing anything if you could always just do it later? And wouldn't an infinite existence eventually get boring? After you've done everything you ever wanted to do a billion times over, what are you going to do in the next? in the infinite amount of time you still have to exist. Indeed, an infinite existence might not only be meaningless, it might eventually become torture. So, like God, it seems that the existence of the soul or afterlife has little bearing on our question about life's meaning. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean that life does have meaning, it just means that accepting those troubling answers doesn't necessarily entail that it is meaningless. Those who suggest that life is not meaningful are called nihilists. One of the most famous, although he actually rejected that title, is Albert Camus. He thought that God was necessary for life to have meaning. Only by God giving us an essence, by giving us a function or purpose, does life even have a chance at being meaningful. Since, as he suggested, God does not exist, he thought life was absurd, that it was meaningless. For Camus, all one can do is realize that the game of life is absurd and just find joy in it and just play it anyway. Camus used the example of the myth of Sisyphus, a man who was cursed by the gods to endlessly roll a rock up a hill only to always have it fall down the other side. Camus argued that all Sisyphus can do, and indeed what he should do, is decide to find meaning in rock rolling 
and take joy in it anyway, despite the absurdity. And so it is, said Camus, with us and our absurd, meaningless lives. This brings us to the suggestion that life can have a subjective meaning, a meaning that derives from our own purposes, plans, attitudes, intentions, and mental states. One can have a meaningful life by accomplishing goals, fulfilling desires, or attaining and promoting virtues that one sees as worthwhile or important. For example, perhaps you think caring for others is important, and so you involve yourself in charities and organizations that do so. Perhaps you value family and find meaning in raising your children. Perhaps there's a political cause you find worth pursuing, and so you work towards that. The idea is that we can have a meaningful life by accomplishing things that we see as meaningful. It's not an objective meaning, but it's meaning all the same. To understand the difference between objective and subjective meaning, think again of the monkeys at a typewriter, you know, that, that old thought experiment, right? A billion monkeys typing randomly on typewriters for a billion years. They would eventually produce a book that, when read by you, makes sense. It would look like it was written by a human author. It will appear as if someone actually intended those words to appear in that order. But compare that book to one that is actually written by a human author. The author's book seems to have a kind of meaning that the monkey's book lacks. We can impose a meaning on the monkey's book, but only the author's book has an independent objective meaning apart from our reading of it. In the same way, we can impose meaning on our lives. We can find purpose in it, but, and we would argue, our lives are not truly objectively meaningful. But I'd like to push back against this in defense of the notion that life can be objectively meaningful. After all, Camus himself thought that finding subjective meaning was kind of a dodge and didn't really address the true problem of life's meaninglessness. First of all, if God can impose an objective meaning on our lives by intending them to have a certain purpose, why can't I do the same with my own life? Why does my intention for my life to have a certain purpose not bestow objective meaning upon it? Sure, I didn't create my own life for that purpose, but suppose God didn't either. Suppose God didn't create the universe. Suppose it's just always existed alongside him. But suppose that, once God's, God notices the universe, God developed a plan for it and then intended me to play a role in that plan. Wouldn't my life still be objectively meaningful? Seems so. But why can't I notice my own life and bestow meaning on it in the same way? By drawing out a plan of life for my life and accomplishing it. After all, if one cannot impose objective meaning on one's own existence, then isn't God's existence meaningless? No one exists above God to instill meaning upon his existence by giving it a purpose. If God's existence has a meaning, then him trying to accomplish his own purposes must be enough to give it meaning. So why can't the same be true for our own existence? Now, simply accomplishing your intended goals or fulfilling desires isn't even sufficient for life to have objective meaning. Why? Just like God giving you a purpose isn't enough to make your life meaningful because he might have an unworthy purpose, like making you food, so too you might choose an unworthy purpose, like one that is trivial, gross, or even harmful. Charles Taylor imagines a person trying to always have exactly 3,732 hairs on his head. I think I fall a little short. Eric Wielenberg, someone who regularly eats his own, he imagines someone who regularly eats his own excrement. And Norman Dahl imagines someone with the goal of always causing pain to others. Would such lives be objectively meaningful? Intuitively, most would say no. Such goals are not worthwhile. But the same intuition suggests that other goals are worthwhile, objectively worthwhile. So why wouldn't accomplishing such worthwhile goals be something that helped produce an objectively meaningful life? Now, the philosopher Julian Beghini would probably warn us to be careful at this juncture. The mere accomplishment of certain goals, even worthwhile goals, can fall short 
when it comes to making life meaningful. The brief satisfaction of accomplishing a goal can often be followed by an empty sensation of not knowing what to do with oneself next. To help ensure a meaningful life, one needs to pick goals that are worthy of pursuit even if they are not accomplished, where the pursuit itself is worthwhile. Perhaps a life spent in the pursuit of justice or fairness could be a good example. The world is never going to be perfectly just or fair, but a life spent trying to make it more so would seem to be a meaningful one. Or consider a life spent on the pursuit of charity and helping others, or a life spent caring for one's family. Such goals seem worthwhile in and of themselves, and as such would seem to impart objective meaning. But this brings me to my point. It seems to me that life can be objectively meaningful because some things simply are intrinsically valuable. They're valuable in and of themselves. Nothing gives them their value. They just are valuable. Consider the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Now, this example may be a little morbid, but stay with me. Make-A-Wish grants the wishes of terminally ill children. If there's something a child has always wanted to do or someone they've always wanted to meet, the Make-A-Wish Foundation tries to make that happen for that child before she dies. But of course, if there is no God, no afterlife, and so on, once that child dies, the universe will be basically the same as it would have been, regardless of whether she got to experience that thing or not. It's not like the child's memory of the event lives on after she dies. And yet, we still think there's objective value in the fact that the child got to have that experience. Why? Because it made her happy. Think back to our discussion of utilitarianism and the suggestion that happiness is an intrinsic value. Now again, we should probably be careful here. As the virtue theorist taught us, mere happiness, momentary pleasure, is likely too shallow or fleeting to really instill objective meaning. Right? Recall that we could be happy in Nozick's experience machine, but that wouldn't be a meaningful existence. We should probably, should probably be thinking in terms of eudaimonia, or well-being, in terms of a flourishing life, or the kind of life that's most worth living. And I don't mean to downplay make a wish, but they can't realistically give children experiences that would provide the kind of life most worth living, even being Batman for a day is a fleeting pleasure. Eudaimonia can only be accomplished over a lifetime with a lot of hard work and maybe a little luck. Regardless, my point still stands. Isn't living such a life, accomplishing eudaimonia, intrinsically valuable? Doesn't it thus have objective meaning? As Julie Beghini might ask, is there really any sense in asking what value or meaning there is in a life that is spent employed doing something you find fulfilling, spending your life and your free time on that which you find most interesting, or helping others and coming home to people who love you and adore you? Sure, once the sun explodes, it will be like your 